Today we're in chapter 16, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through uh, 31 as we continue our verse-by-verse study here in the Gospel of Luke. And, and what we'll do is we'll take verse 18 and touch on that and then move into verse 19 to the conclusion of the um, chapter because what we see in verse 18 is a teaching Jesus gives related to divorce, and then in verse 19 following, he gives a story concerning a rich man and a man by the name of Lazarus. And so, let's look at verse 18. We'll look at that for a few moments, then move into the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And so, in Luke chapter 16, verse 18, Luke writes, "'Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery.'" And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, what we need to do is we need to put this in context, and we need to remember what's taking place here. Jesus is addressing Pharisees. These Pharisees are listening to the teachings that he is giving. And according to verse 14 here in chapter 16, uh, as they are listening to Jesus give his teaching, they deride him. And so, as they're listening, they're actually scoffing at him. The Bible in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9 says, fools mock at sin. And that's exactly what these Pharisees are doing. These Pharisees are mocking or deriding the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, they are, they're unreceptive to the things that he has to say. They have no desire to learn the things of the kingdom. They're absolutely self-satisfied with their own lives. And so they don't want to hear what God has to say concerning how they could be right with him. It reminds me of what the writer of Proverbs in chapter 1, verse 22, when he asked the question, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Well, that's what's taking place here. The Pharisees are listening to Jesus Christ speak, and as they are listening to him, as it says here in verse 14, they begin to deride him. So as they're deriding him, Jesus begins to address them personally. And and he is speaking to them and he's telling them things that are very personal. He says that you justify yourselves. But God is looking at your heart and as God looks at your heart, he is repulsed by it. You see, in the rejecting of the things that the Lord is saying, they're rejecting God himself. They hadn't received the witness of John the Baptist, though God sent him. And so they are rejecting God's witness to them and how they could get right with God. And so as Jesus is speaking to them, he continues and and in verse 18 picks up another topic by speaking concerning divorce. And he says in verse 18, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. And so not only do the Pharisees love money and not only do they reject Jesus Christ and the witness of John the Baptist, They are also reducing the ordinances of God as it relates to marriage. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives grounds for divorce. And he says that the grounds for biblical uh, divorce is unlawful sexual intercourse or adultery. In Matthew 5, verse 32, he said, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. And so he's saying a person with no biblical right to a divorce has no right to remarriage. And so he's saying that the biblical grounds for divorce would be adultery. Now, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7, the Apostle Paul actually gives to us another legitimate ground for divorce, and it can occur when an unbeliever wants to end the marriage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, Paul said, If the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. And so if an unbelieving spouse deserts or dis- divorces a believer, the believer is no longer bound and is free to remarry another believer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says at verse 27, Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. It's not as if you are going to divorce so that you can find something better down the line. If I'm a Christian married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever d- desires to depart, God has called me to peace and therefore I allow them to depart. But that doesn't mean that I go out seeking for a Christian mate so that I can be fulfilled. It simply means that they don't want to be with me any longer. So when Jesus is speaking here in verse 18, he's basically saying, you have taken God's word and you've begun to change it so that it suits your purposes. 
But you need to understand something about marriage, he's saying, and something that you have reduced, and that is this. If a person out of convenience divorces somebody and remarries, that is not the biblical grounds for divorce, and therefore it's a sin. And so that's what he's speaking about in verse 18. Now he moves on in verse 19 and gives this parable, or this story actually, concerning a rich man and a man by the name of Lazarus. Let's pick up at verse 19, and I'll read to the end of the chapter, and we'll look at this together. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. The rich man and Lazarus. In order to understand the story, we need to remember what Jesus has been speaking and how that he has been sharing concerning the fact that there was a a steward who had been wasting his employer's goods. And when he had been brought into accountability and was fired because of his malfeasance, he had done everything that he could in order to secure himself for his future. And what Jesus had been saying, it's found here in chapter 16 at verse 10, was that financial stewardship is a test of one's character. And then he went on in verse 13 to point out that you cannot serve God and dwell simultaneously. Living for the flesh and excluding the spirit always ends up in destruction. The Bible in Proverbs 11:28 makes it clear, he who trusts in riches will fall. And Ecclesiastes 5.10 so says, Whoever loves money never has money enough, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This, too, is meaningless. And so the Lord has already spoken concerning that, and he's been sharing concerning what is really true wealth and all. And so to illustrate this, he gives this story concerning a rich man and a man by the name of Lazarus. Now, this is the only parable where Jesus actually uses somebody's name. And so... There are many commentators, conservative commentators, who believe that this is actually a real event that Jesus is speaking about and not simply a parable. We need to remember one thing for sure, and that is the Pharisees who are lovers of money and its advantages are the ones who are being addressed in this. And so what you have is two characters. You have a rich man and you have a poor man, a rich man who is unnamed and a poor man who has a name. The name is Lazarus. And so first we are introduced to this rich man. And, and remember with me how Jesus described him. This man was clothed in, clothed in purple and linen and he fared sumptuously every day. So the way he is spoken about tells us that he is a very wealthy man because when he says that he was wearing purple, purple is an expensive garment. It was dyed with a rare and precious dye. This was something that was worn by royalty or nobility. When he speaks about linen, that's an undergarment that is brilliant white and it's worth twice its weight in gold. And when he speaks of him faring sumptuously or eating daily in such a way, he had daily banquets. And in those banquets, he had servants as well as a multitude of guests. And so the picture that he's drawing for us is is an extremely, incredibly 
extremely credibly rich man. Somebody who's got so much money that, that none of us probably in this room could understand it. I most certainly can't, and I'm assuming that most of you can't either. I can't understand that. I mean, I hear about these fellows who have lots of money, and it, it, you know, once you get past a million, to me, that is so far beyond my comprehension. I just don't get it. So when I hear that Oprah has like one in 1.5 billion dollars, billion dollars, I haven't got a clue what that means. You know, it's just so far beyond me. I just wish he'd tithe to this church. But anyway, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't get it. I mean, and do you get it? I mean, can you get it? I, I, I just cannot relate to that, you know, and, and men like Bill Gates and others like that who have such an incredible amount of money that if they dropped a $100 bill and stopped to pick it up, they're wasting their time because they're worth more than that $100 per second. I, I can't relate to that at all. But that's the picture Jesus is giving to us. He's giving us a picture of a man who is incredibly wealthy, a man who eats banquets every day, a man who wears clothing uh, as undergarments that are, are, are worth a king's ransom. This is somebody that Jesus is portraying as an incredibly rich man who lives like nobility. He lives in royal luxury, but the problem is this is a man who's filled with selfish greed. You see, he's got a neighbor, somebody who actually lives at his front gate, somebody he doesn't even really know, a very poor man who is there. And, and, and this man who is having a banquet every day in his house doesn't have a clue that there's somebody right outside. Verse 20 says, there's a certain beggar named Lazarus full of swords who's laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. This is somebody who's got absolutely nothing going for him at all. Now, you see in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, chapter 15, verse 11, when God was giving his law to the nation of Israel, God said, the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy, in your land. You should be generous to those who are in need, is what he is saying here. Those who have genuine need, you ought to be compassionate towards, and you ought to care for them. This man had somebody at his gate, the gate of his estate, who was laying there, who was saying, I don't have any food. I'll eat the crumbs. Anything that falls from your table, I'm willing to take. Now, this man is named Lazarus. Now, the name Lazarus means God is my help, which gives to us insight concerning this man because his name is intended to contrast with the unnamed rich man. This is a man who has a genuine faith in God, and we'll see that in just a moment. But he has a genuine faith in God. He trusts and relies on the Lord. James, in chapter 2, verse 5, says it like this. He says, "'Listen, my beloved brethren,' Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? While Lazarus is an example of somebody who, though he is materially poor, is rich in faith. And he's a person who's given, Jesus gives as a description of complete poverty. He says that he's a beggar, a poor beggar. That word beggar speaks of somebody who is completely destitute. He describes him as being full of sores. This is a person who has a continual uh, abscesses in his flesh that are not healing. This is one who is laid at the gates by his friends, undoubtedly, but that tells us that he is a homeless man. This is somebody who desires to be fed. He's starving, and so the servants are actually feeding him the table scraps. This is, this is a person living on the welfare of other people. And then he goes on to describe him as one that the street dogs are licking his sores. Some would say this is something to show us how, how repulsive his life has become. There are others that would say that, that that was the only medical treatment he was getting when the dogs would come and actually lick his sores is a form of medicinal treatment. And so the point he's making is he has no medical aid. He's incapable of having anything for himself because he's poor, he's destitute. He relies on the welfare of other people, has absolutely nothing going for him. He is one in complete poverty. And so you have the contrast between a man who is incredibly rich and a man who is incredibly poor. That's the whole picture that Jesus has given to us. Now, as is true with all flesh, verse 22, the beggar died. 
and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. And so, as is true with all human life, it ultimately comes to an end. Lazarus dies, and as he dies, he's buried in an unmarked pauper's grave, but he's carried by the angels. The rich man dies, but he's buried extravagantly, carried by men. The bottom line is, is all the riches this man had could not prevent him from dying. Though he had every advantage, he's going to die just like anybody else does. The psalmist in Psalm 49, verses 16 and 17 says, Do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendor of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him. And so this is a very extravagantly rich man who had a king's funeral, whereas you have Lazarus who's got nobody to even attend him at his death. And he goes on and it says in verse 23, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And so he's in Abraham's bosom. I'm going to look at that with you for a moment and give you some details. Abraham's bosom is what is called the temporary abode of the righteous dead. It's a compartment of what is called Hades. The righteous would go to Abraham's bosom. This was a place that was a temporary receptacle prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And according to verse 25, it's a picture of a place where you are comforted because that's what is said there, now he is comforted. And so it's a place of comfort. It's a picture of that. It's a comfort and a rest. Now, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the place of the righteous dead is now heaven. You see, prior to Jesus dying and being buried, if you were a righteous individual, you had faith in God and you died, you'd go to this compartment that was referred to as Abraham's bosom. Hades was divided, Hades being a temporary receptacle of human souls, Hades was divided into two compartments. You have one compartment that is the abode of the righteous dead called Abraham's bosom. The second compartment that is where the unrighteous are reserved. And you'll see this in a second. I'll give you some scripture on this. But that's the temporary place. Now, Jesus Christ dies on the cross. He's buried and he's resurrected. This is what we are celebrating this season as we are now in the Easter season. So Jesus dies, he's buried, and he's resurrected. When that takes place, he enters into Abraham's bosom, the abode of the righteous dead, and he takes them with him to go to heaven. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 says, when Jesus ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. And so the Lord Jesus Christ went and took those who were righteous awaiting uh, this, this moment with him to heaven. And now we have a place that we go to when we die, and, and we can now know that, that we go directly to heaven. There's no in-between place for us. There's no waiting place for us. You see, as I grew up, I was taught that there was a place that you had to go to that was in between heaven and earth, and it was a place called purgatory. How many of you have heard that, purgatory? How many were you taught that? That's a place of, of uh, 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 they would say in the Catholic Church, I was raised Catholic, that it was a temporary place where a purging took place, you know, and normally it was by fire. A purging would take place, and the residual effects of your temporal sins was dealt with in purgatory and all of that, and that's what I was taught as, as a Bible-believing Christian, I, I don't believe in the place called purgatory, though junior high ministry is pretty close to purgatory. It, it's theologically similar. It's a place of purging. But the Bible tells us that we are not purged by fire. We are purged by the blood of Jesus Christ. And there is no in-between place. There is no stopping over place. I was also taught that the souls of unbaptized infants go to a place called limbo. How many of you heard of that and not the chubby checker song? Okay. <laughs> Limbo is a place of, uh, of beauty and wonderfulness, but it's not equal to heaven because unbaptized infant souls, that's what I was taught. I don't know if there's been any changes since I was practicing the Catholic faith and all. Perhaps I have some in this room who could let me know. But uh, that was where the unbaptized souls of infants would go. And so you had a place called limbo. You had a place called purgatory. The Bible knows 
of neither. That doesn't exist. Neither one of those places exists. Those are inventions, unfortunately and sadly, inventions of man and man's traditions, but not Scripture. You see, prior to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there's a place called Hades. Hades answers to Sheol in the Old Testament. Hades is a compartment of the, or a receptacle, if you will, of the dead souls. Some are reserved for judgment, others being reserved for everlasting life prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But after Jesus Christ dies, is buried, and is resurrected, if I, as a, a person who has faith in him, when I go home, I go home to be with the Lord. I go to be with him. How do I know that? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 says that. Paul said, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So when I close my eyes here, it's only to open them up there. I behold the face of the Lord Jesus Christ when I close my eyes here in sleep and death. I'm actually just going directly to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, Paul said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. I desire to depart and be with Christ. Now, where is Jesus? Jesus is in heaven. He ascended, and he sitteth at the right hand of the Father. And so when Paul is saying, I desire to be with Christ, it's another way of saying, I want to go to heaven. Because Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And so for me, I have a hope of heaven. I have a place that I know I'm going to go to. Not by my own works of righteousness. Of course not. When I first got saved, I, I was so overwhelmed with that as a brand new believer. The thought that, that I was going to go to heaven it was so beyond me. So beyond me, because again, in, in my own religious heritage, I was never taught that I could actually know that. I, I was taught that one of the ways to secure heaven would be to make sure I made a good confession on my deathbed, to have absolution, and then to have people praying for me so that I might exit from purgatory early. I even knew of prayers that you would pray for the souls of those who were departed, and there are masses that are given, even to this day, for the souls of those who have departed so that they might have some credit and re reduce their sentence, if you will, in purgatory, and that's how I was raised. I had no hope of heaven. I didn't know you could go to heaven. And so when I found that the Word of God actually says, absent from the body, present with the Lord, that Jesus said, where I am, there you may be also, blew my mind. I, and so I'd tell people, I'd say, man, I'm going to go to heaven. Now, this was before, you know, this is a long time ago. This is back in 1970, 71. So people at that time said, still knew that there should be some quality in your life that, that demonstrates that you're a person who's heaven bound. And so they would say to me, I had this happen more than once. They'd say, what gives you the right to say you're going to go to heaven? You're not that good. You're not that good. As a matter of fact, you're not good at all. What gives you the right to think that you're going to go to heaven? And I would answer that question. I would say, it's not based on my own goodness. I was taught this from the very beginning. It's not based on my own goodness. It's not that I'm good. It's that Jesus is good. And Jesus paid my price. He died on the cross for me. He took my sin upon himself. And his blood has washed me and cleansed me, freed me from my sin. So yeah, I'm going to heaven, not based on works of righteousness, which I have done. But according to his mercy, he saved me by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So I have a relationship with God in that way. No, it's not because I'm good. God knows that there's none good. No, not one. So you can know that. You can know that you're going to go to heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, reserved in heaven for you. And so I can know, and you as a believer can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that heaven is your home. Not because you're so good or because I'm so good, but because he is so good. Because Jesus Christ paid the price. Because he's the righteous one who made it possible. And when he ascended, he took captivity captive and gave gifts to men. 
And so I can know that heaven's doors are now open unto me and I can enter in through faith in Jesus Christ and stand before him wearing robes of righteousness that I have gained by putting my faith in him. And this righteousness is called in Scripture an imputed righteousness. It's given to me. It's something I don't have on my own, but he has given it to me. He's clothed me in that robe. And so I can stand before him made in the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ and I can enter into heaven through faith in him. You see, and so as we're looking at this, this is prior to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so it speaks concerning it in that way. You see, sometimes when you read the Scripture, if you have a King James Bible, it usually translates uh, various words by a single English word, and the single English word is hell. But there are various words that you find in both the Old and the New Testament that speak concerning this one place that the King James, unfortunately, normally will translate with a single word. But there are different words. Like I mentioned, there's the word Sheol that you find in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you have the word Tartarus, and you have the Abuso, and you have, you have Guiana, and you have, uh, you have Hades. And, and Hades is what is being referred to here in this particular portion of Scripture. You see, Hades is not the place of final judgment. As I said earlier, it's a temporary receptacle. People actually remain in this place called Hades, until final judgment. So if you're in this room tonight and you're not saved, you're not a Christian, and you die, you don't go to heaven. You go to a place called Hades. Hades is a temporary receptacle for human souls awaiting judgment. In 2 Peter, in chapter 2, verse 9, the apostle said, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So the unjust being reserved are in a place called Hades. Ultimately, the final judgment or the final place of judgment is called the lake of fire. Jesus also uses the word kiena. Guiana, during the time of Christ, is there in the Valley of Hinnom. It was a place where the refuse was burned. That's why Jesus would speak of it and say, it's where the flame is never quenched and the worm dieth not. The reason he referred to hell in that fashion is because that was a picture of a continuing judgment. And so, if you died tonight unsaved, you go into a place called Hades, and you are there being reserved unto judgment. Ultimately, at the, the final judgment, you are going to be standing before the throne of God, and you will receive the due penalty for a life of sin. In Revelation 20, verses 13 through 15, the apostle John writes, The sea gave up the dead who are in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Death and Hades being the temporary receptacle of bodies and souls is now swallowed up by that which is permanent, the lake of fire. He said, this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so when Jesus is speaking here, I want you to know something about the ministry and teachings of Jesus Christ. Uh, he spoke about hell as a literal place. He spoke of it and gives to us, and we'll see this in a moment, a little more detail, but he spoke of it as a literal place. As a matter of fact, I know you, you know this already, but perhaps you don't. When you study the Gospels, you read through them, you'll discover that Jesus spoke more about hell than he ever did about heaven. I find that interesting. That's because he doesn't want us to go to hell. So he talks about hell. Because in avoiding hell and coming to Christ, then you go to heaven. So he warns us several times throughout the different Gospels concerning this final judgment. What you have here in Luke chapter 16 is actually a story that relates to that because he's making it very clear. Now remember, in context to those Pharisees who are trusting in their riches and think they're righteous because they've been financially, quote-unquote, blessed, they're trusting in their riches, deriding his teachings, and Jesus is now bringing them into an accountability. That's what he's doing. You know, we look at Jesus, Jesus sweet, meek, and mild, but Jesus was very strong. And as Jesus is speaking, he's very to the point and very cutting. And he's speaking to these people who do not like hearing what they're hearing, but he's telling them the story, and they're listening. And so as this is taking place, you have, again in verse 23, being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes 
and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Notice, for I am tormented in this flame. Now again, he's in Hades, this rich man. This is the temporary place of the unrighteous dead. And I want you to see this. Jesus makes it clear that those who go there have a continuation of existence. They are conscious, they possess memory, and are in constant torment. That word torment speaks of torture or pain, agony. It speaks of grief. And so that's where he is. But I want you to see something about this man because even though he is there in torment, notice how it says in verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He's still giving orders. He's still giving orders. You know, there he is telling Father Abraham what to do. He's still giving orders because that is part of his character. And so as he says that, have him come, dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue, I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, verse 25, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. Likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Abraham says, listen, bro. He didn't quite say it like that. (laughs) He said, in your lifetime, you went for the gold. In your lifetime... You, you went for the pleasure. In your lifetime, you accumulated as much as you could because you wanted to enjoy your lifetime, and you did. You had everything money could buy. You had food. You had fine clothing. You had servants. You had everything that a human being could want, every single thing. There was nothing that, that if you wanted, there was nothing you couldn't have. Nothing. You could have it all. Again, isn't that difficult to understand? It is for me. Those of us who live on budgets, though we are artificially rich, we call it plastic. We're artificially rich, but we eventually have to pay for all the stuff that we buy, and then we forget at the end of the payment what it is that we've been paying for for these last three years. And they usually break at the conclusion of their warranty And trash cans are filled with treasures that people just had to have and were willing to do almost anything to get. And every every week, the trash man comes and picks up that thing that I just had to have, that thing that just meant so much to me. Every week, they come and dumps are filled with human treasures, filled with them. Things we had to have. We had to have those shoes. We had to have those clothes. We had to have that whatever it may be. Had to have it. And they always become obsolete the minute we buy them because there's always this new and improved thing that comes out. Well, a rich man doesn't really care because a rich man can walk in and say, well, he goes into a, a car lot and he sees this $1.5 million Bugatti and he doesn't ask what the gas mileage is on it. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about the insurance. It doesn't matter because he's only going to drive it once in a while anyway. He's not going to drive it every day. It's not a grocery getter. It's not something he's going to put the kids in and take them to soccer practice. This is a car that he'll have just to show to his friends. And I've seen sometimes, I've seen some of these very wealthy men buying these cars that you know they'll never drive, spending six, dollars $700,000 on, on a special vehicle that they really want, over a million dollars on a Duesenberg. And I've seen them in the auctions doing that. These are cars that they're just going to put in a garage and every once in a while invite a friend over to look at it and walk around and say, look what I have. And I don't ever start it. You know, I never drive it. All I do is polish it, you know, but it's really cool. Look what I've got. And they're so rich, they don't even remember they have that. I heard about a guy who was looking for a particular painting. He had seen this painting in, in, in a magazine and he was an art collector and he said, I really want this painting. I, I, I've got to have it. So he had a fellow who would go and acquire his paintings for him and so he calls him and he says, look it, I want this because and this is what it's called, and, and it's worth this much, and I want it. I want you to hunt it down until you get it because I'd like to have it. And so a few weeks later, he gets a phone call from this guy who hunts down this artwork, and he says, I discovered where it is. I found that painting, and the man says to him, great, uh, where is it? And he says, you already own it. 
This guy had so many things, he didn't even catalog them. He already had the thing that he was looking for. And that's the way it really works when you're rich, when you're overly abundantly rich in this fashion. When you've got so much, you don't even think about anything. You, you, you walk into a store and you can buy anything you want. You can buy the whole store if you want. You walk in and say, I want that, want, what? I want this store. You can buy the store. You can buy. And see, we don't understand that, but this rich man would. And in his lifetime, even as Abraham is saying, you received your good things. You had everything that you wanted. There was nothing that, that you, you saw that you kept yourself from getting. But, but on the other hand, you are now going to reap what you've sowed. You know, Paul tells the Galatians in chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, that also shall he reap. And so if we sow to the flesh from the flesh, we, we reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit from the Spirit, we, we reap everlasting life. And, and, and that's the, the law of sowing and reaping. And he's simply saying to him, you're getting what you wanted. This is what you wanted. You're simply just cashing in your chips now. And so in your lifetime, you received your good things. Lazarus, evil things. Now he's comforted. You are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And so, people who die without the Lord end up without Him for eternity. And even if they had everything they wanted on the face of the earth, it still wasn't enough. And so what does he do? Verse 27, he says, I, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Those who die without the Lord don't want those whom they love to die without him. Interesting, as, as it's being portrayed here. Interesting. Atheists ultimately believe in God because they see him face to face. It's too late when they ultimately do believe, but they do ultimately believe. The Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So these people, and the picture here is him coming to his senses too late, but he doesn't want his family to end up where he has ended up. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want them to end up there. I've done a number of funerals over the years, and, and the very first funeral to many of the others following that I ever did was a funeral for a person who died without Christ. And I have to tell you, it's very awkward when you, as a biblical minister, when you do a funeral, because people come to funerals and they want to hear good things. They want to hear hope. They want to hear positive things. They want to hear wonderful things about this guy. And as a, as a pastor, I'm not going to lie to them. I'm not going to have them walk out thinking they're okay if they don't know Jesus Christ. It's very awkward, guys. The very first funeral I ever did was for a man who was, was a pretty, pretty, pretty sinful man, to be honest with you. And uh, those who were at the funeral were, were his friends who were, well, I, you know, without demeaning them, because I'm not intending to, I'm just describing. Um, well, I, when I grew up, I heard the term ladies in red. I don't know if any of you have even heard that term before. Prostitutes were called ladies in red. That's what they used to be called a long time ago. And if my mom were talking to me, she, she might use that phrase, they're ladies in red. Well, ladies in red spoke of a prostitute. These ladies who were at the funeral, at a funeral, were, were, were prostitutes. They were literally dressed in red, you know, and bleached hair. And, and then I'm looking at them, and, and the other ones, well, they, they were gamblers. They were racetrack junkies. I mean, that was his friends. That, that, that was who he hung around with. And, and I remember my very first funeral that I ever did was to a crowd of people who had no relationship at all with God in any way, shape, or form. And I, I still, still remember walking out, and I've done this many times since, and I've said, we're here to remember, and I gave the name of the person. You know, he lived this long. He left behind these relatives. 
and I said at this point, if he had an opportunity to share with you, I think this is what he would share with you. Fear God, depart from evil. And I just gave him a straight gospel message about how to get saved, how to be right with Jesus Christ. Because I know that if this man who's in this casket had an opportunity to share with you, he'd have the same heart that this rich man has. And I want you to see that when he says, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Warn them that they not come here. Send Lazarus. Perhaps a voice from the other side can bear witness of eternity. Send him to tell him, do not come here. Do everything you can to stay from here. But what is Abraham's response? Verse 29, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. They have the scriptures. They have Moses and the prophets, Moses representing the law and the prophets. They have the law and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the scriptures. Let them read the word of God. Let them trust God's word. The law and the prophets point. They are pointers to, to Jesus Christ. They, they, they point you to faith in him. Let them read the word of God. In John 5, 45 through 47, Jesus said, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There's one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. If you believed Moses, you would believe me. He wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You already have the witness. It's the witness of God's word. So he says, they need to simply read God's word and it will direct them to faith. That's what they need. But what's his response? He says, no, in verse 30. If one goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. They need a sign, not God's word. They need a sign, not the Bible. They need a sign. Well, in Matthew 12, 38 through 40, some of the scribes and Pharisees said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The most amazing sign you'll ever have is going to be the resurrection, and the Word of God points to that. The Word of God directs our attention to that. So he says, listen, the law and the prophets are sufficient to cause your brothers to have a saving faith in God. Let them trust God's word. No, we want a sign. Well, listen, verse 31, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Signs will not convince them. Only God's word can. Sometimes people, even in this day, as a matter of fact, especially in this day, are looking for signs, they're looking for miracles, they're looking for something outside of God's Word. They don't want to trust the Word of God. I find it interesting, and I'll just say this briefly, I find it interesting, this controversy that's going on right now, and controversies are stirred up every political election year, and here we have another one, relating to this quote-unquote pastor in Chicago and, and the things that he said from his pulpit, uh, the obscenities and the various things that he says. And, and, you know, the argumentation either way, and I've been listening, perhaps some of you have too, I've been listening to the argumentation related to that. But I listen as a pastor. I'm not listening as somebody who's going to vote for this person or not vote for him. I'm, I'm listening as a pastor. I want to see what the world thinks about somebody standing up and saying the things that are being said by this pastor. And I find it e interesting. And one of the things that I was just reading today concerning that was where a woman was saying, well, leave him alone because he has a right to his own opinion even as, as, as an opinion that none of us really, most of us do not agree with. And as a pastor, I read that and I think, well, you know, it's really not that simplistic now, is it? I mean, because as a minister of the gospel, I have a responsibility to give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. That's my responsibility, to not change it so I can appeal to people's 
ears, tickling ears, as Paul would say, but rather let's just divide the word and allow God to work in our hearts. That's what a minister is supposed to do, guys. That's what ministers did for many years. That was, that's what ministers used to do habitually. Unfortunately, we live in a time now where somebody will defend a minister who's not even given the word of God and saying he has his right to his opinion. Well, I'd say, sure, of course, we all have our opinions. But when I'm behind this pulpit, I need to be careful to restrict my opinions and try and stay as solidly biblical as I can. And so from that aspect, I would disagree when I would say, yes, he has his right to his opinions. Of course, every person has their own opinions. That's just the way it is. People do. But when you're there ministering to 8,500 people, you ought to be giving them God's word. You ought to be encouraging them in the things of God. You need to teach them to hunger for the Word of God and encourage those who do and feed them the Word of God so that their lives can be blessed by God. That's what ministers are supposed to do. We're not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to rightly divide the Word of God presented because His Word is truth, and that's how you're saved, and that's how you're kept, and that's how you grow, and that's how you mature, and that's how God works through you, and that's what motivates you to go out and talk to other people about the truth of Jesus Christ because the truth sets you free. And, and if we adhere to the truth, God will bless our lives. That's what ministers are supposed to do. So I don't minimize that at all because it's, it's, it's really something that relates to heaven and hell, not our social welfare at this moment. It's more important for me to enter into the kingdom of God. I have a very poor man here by the name of Lazarus who's being used as an example of somebody who goes into heaven and is comforted by God, and I have a rich man who's got everything, every social thing that he needs, every financial thing that he needs, who ends up in torment. Which would I rather be? Well, if it's an either or, I'd rather be Lazarus because I I have eternity before me. You see, this man here, if this is a true event, this man has been tormented for the last 2,000 years. And for the last 2,000 years, Lazarus has been comforted. Now, which do I want to be? I want to be the person who's being comforted. I want to be the person who's being blessed by God. They're receiving from God consolation. And if it means I have a short time on earth that I don't really live a life that perhaps is as beneficial as others, if I don't have the things, well, you know what? When I'm in heaven, I don't think I'll think about that. I don't think that's going to be something I'm going to want to talk to the Lord about. I don't think I'm going to take him aside in the corner of heaven and say to him, excuse me, but why didn't you give me more? I rather doubt that. I think that when I'm with him in, in heaven, I'm going to say, man, am I blessed to be here in the first place. Doesn't really matter to me what, what I had on earth. Those things are, they're, they're all forgotten. He wipes the tears from your eyes. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more discomfort. There's no more illness. There's no more anything. There's only joy at the right hand of God, pleasures forevermore. Why would I worry about the riches on earth when I've got pleasures in heaven that are stored up for me, you see? And that's what we're supposed to be looking at. That's what we're supposed to be desiring. And that's what Jesus, I believe, is saying. He's saying, you guys are lovers of money. I already spoke concerning the fact that there was an unjust steward who was wiser in this age than the children of light are because he, he feathered his nest here on earth. Well, let me emphasize this a second time because you're lovers of money. Let me tell you that this rich man had all the money in the world and ended up going to hell. And by the way, that's what he's saying to these Pharisees that they're going to end up doing. And he's basically giving to them a choice. What's it going to be, he's saying to them? You have a choice. You see, in the resurrection of Christ, which we to this day continue to preach, Jesus who was resurrected, we preach a living Christ. And yet, what does he say? He says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. What are you saying, Jesus? It would seem that Jesus is saying, Moses and the prophets are pointing towards my resurrection. I will be resurrected, and they will still remain in unbelief, even though one rise from the dead. Why? because they are lovers of money rather than lovers of God, because they're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of the Lord. And as long as they're in love with pleasure and money, they're not even going to see the wonderfulness of God. And so he's actually calling them to a choice. Which is it going to be, heaven or hell? Which is it going to be? And that's the purpose of this particular story of Lazarus, and the rich man, which is it going to be?